of the overpasses of the Polk Parkway, about 30 feet. She was hypotensive and tachycardic in the field, but she was alert and oriented. And so these are her trauma bay x-rays. So probably most of you can see that they're not, if you're used to looking at x-rays, these are not perfect x-rays. There's some radio opaque stuff in there, but this is pretty much the x-rays that you'll see in the trauma bay. And we always get a pelvis x-ray and we always get a chest x-ray. And that kind of will rule out things that are very bad for the patient and somebody who's very unstable. So one thing you'll probably notice right away is this is one part of the hemipelvis here and then this part is a lot higher than the other. And you can see here, she's got fractures here too. And this is another x-ray from the trauma bay. So anybody know what kind of fracture this would be? Just broadly? No, no participators? Okay. So it's a pelvic fracture, and then we describe pelvic fractures um, in three different, three different types, and this is the vertical shear type. This is probably the most dangerous pelvic fracture. This is one of the ones that has the highest rate of mortality, and it's anywhere up to 25%. For you to get a fracture like this, you had to have had a lot of high energy through the body to be able to break the pelvis and lift the pelvis up like that. And one of the ways in which people have uh, high mortality is, is there's a high risk of bleeding and hypovolemic shock. So this is the um, CAT scan. Now we can get CAT scans and we actually it's really nice for pelvis fractures and acetabular fractures. They can format it into a 3D image, and you can actually rotate it, and it helps a lot for uh, preoperative planning. So you can see here, she's fractured through her sacrum, and these little holes here are where the nerve roots come out. So she actually has a fracture through where the nerve root comes out. So this is a high risk of having nerve injury, and you can see her rami fractures really well. And you can see on here that she has a lot of vertical displacement, which is why they call it a vertical shear fracture. And that's the back of the pelvis. You can see the sacral fracture pretty well here. So when we talk about pelvic ring injuries, we talk about three types, and it's based on the, on the mechanism of injury. So the first type is an anterior posterior compression. So I have a pelvis. So if you get hit in the front, anterior to posterior force, the pelvis wants to rotate out or externally rotate. And so you can have varying degrees of how much the pelvis wants to rotate. And if it's a really bad fracture, the strongest ligaments in the body are these posterior sacroiliac ligaments. This is a sacroiliac joint. If the pelvis externally rotates a lot, you'll break through that ligament and your entire hemipelvis will rotate out. The other type of fracture um, that you'll get, so that's a kind of like a saddle injury. If you're on a motorcycle, you get hit from the front, your symphysis tears, and if it's really high energy, your whole pelvis will externally rotate. Another type of injury is if you get hit from the side. So we see this in two types of people, either high energy injury, somebody gets hit by a car, or little old ladies who fall, they fall on their hip, and they get these lateral compression fractures. So instead of the pelvis externally rotating, the whole thing caves in and it internally rotates. And then the third type, probably the most dangerous type, is what we call these vertically, uh, vertical shear fractures, which is what the patient had. And that's usually from a fall or a jump. Your whole lower extremity gets hit on the ground and your whole pelvis rotates up. And those are probably the most dangerous because they're rotationally and vertically unstable. So I think some things that you can uh, take away in the field when you see patients that might have a pelvic fracture is just to be suspicious for it. Because if you're suspicious that someone has a pelvic fracture, you'll know that this is probably somebody um, who's had a high energy injury, who probably has a lot of other injuries, possibly visceral injuries or lung contusions. So if they're awake and alert, which oftentimes if they have a bad pelvic injury, they're not because they've had head trauma, you can, they'll be complaining of groin pain. They might have limb shortening, limb length discrepancy. Their limb will be rotated. So those are things that you can look for and say this patient might have a pelvic ring injury. The other thing, which can take a while to develop, although if they're bleeding a lot, um, they can have a pelvic, pelvic swelling or pelvic hematoma or uh, scrotal swelling. So if you see any of those things, you should think that maybe this person has a pelvic ring injury. And one thing that you can think about when you have pelvic ring injury is that they're probably gonna have a lot of bleeding from their injury. And so this is just a chart of how many uh, units people need to be transfused to have pelvic ring injuries. And this anterior posterior compression injury, the type three, is the one that's associated with the most hemorrhage. So there's some things that you can do in the field that can actually help to decrease hemorrhaging and stabilize them before they even get to the hospital. So I don't know if, if you guys talked about this today yet, but um, 
Does anyone do pelvic sheeting in the field? Does anyone know what that is? Oh, you just learned it? Okay. Do you guys do it in the field or no? No? So that, that's actually something you can do very easily, um, and you really don't need much other than a sheet. They have these binders that are pretty expensive that they use in the military, um, but you really only need a sheet. And if you don't have a sheet, one thing you can do to close down the pelvis, and I do it in the operating room all the time to help with my reductions before I prep and drape them, is just to internally rotate the legs. That will close down the pelvis a lot, and you can just tape them there or put a sheet around them if you don't have enough to put a pelvic binder on. So this is how we would sheet in the emergency room. So you basically take a towel, a sheet that's in thirds. People pull on either side, and we put these clamps on. Um, but if you don't have clamps, you can tie a knot or wrap it around. You don't need to put clamps on. And the biggest thing is, is where, to, how to, where to apply the, the pelvic binder so, or the, or the uh, sheet. So it should be over the greater trochanter. A lot of people apply it over the hips because it seems like it should be over the hips. But if you really want to put a force through the pelvis, it should be over your trochanters. And a lot of people, I remember in residency, we had, um, we have like the interns by themselves in the ER. And these are people that have a lot of other injuries. They're very sick patients. So putting a pelvic binder on or a sheet, no one's ever going to fault you, even if they don't have a pelvic ring, ring injury, if you put the sheet on properly. Um, we had a patient who had a, a diaphragmatic hernia, and the interns put on the sheet, but they put it up by the ilium. So they got x-rays before the sheet and x-rays after, and they had herniated the abdominal contents into the uh, chest cavity. So if you're going to put it on, and the one thing you can remember is that it has to be over the greater trochanters. So does anyone know what that does to how it works? What's that? Right, so you can, it closes down the, the pelvic volume. So you can bleed up to four liters into your retroperitoneal space. Um, and so if you have venous bleeding, and I emphasize venous bleeding, you can cause a tamponade if you can close down some of that pelvic volume. So there's five, people have a, a 70 kilogram male has about five liters of uh, blood. So you can bleed almost your entire blood volume into your pelvis. So if someone's hemodynamically unstable and you think they might have a pelvic ring injury, um, then there's nothing wrong with you know, putting a sheet on. So this is just an x-ray. This is a pretty bad pelvic ring injury. They've externally rotated their pelvis, and they actually have a SI joint dislocation. So this is that APC3 that we talk about. That's the one that's most associated with hemorrhage. This is before the sheet was put on, and this is after the sheet. So it can really close down the pelvis. So does it always work? No. There's sometimes when it, when it won't work. And one of the times, most importantly, when it doesn't work is when you have arterial bleeding. So if you have arterial bleeding, uh, one of the algorithms that we use in the ER is if somebody comes in, they're hemodynamically unstable, the first thing you want to do is you want to give them some, blood, some fluids, so some normal saline. That usually will get their pressure up. If it doesn't, the general surgeons will do it fast because one of the reasons you might be bleeding into your uh, bleeding and you can't see the bleeding is because you're bleeding into your belly. If that's negative, then another reason is that you're bleeding into your pelvis, which is also why we get the pelvic x-rays. So if you have a pelvic x-ray and someone has a pelvic fracture, you are hemodynamically unstable, the first thing you'd want to do in the ER is put a sheet on them. If the sheet doesn't work, it's probably because they have arterial bleeding, which you can't tamponade. Um, so what we would usually do then, hopefully, is that we'll call interventional radiology, and they'll go to interventional radiology, and there'll be a large bleeder that they can usually coil or embolize. The other time that, and this is probably the most, one of the most life-threatening injuries in orthopedics, is an open pelvic fracture, meaning they have a pelvic fracture and they have some sort of wound. And it usually looks like this. It'll be a groin wound, wound something like that. And you can't really stop the bleeding. Nothing's going to tamponade it. So if you see that, that person really needs to get to a hospital quickly because those are the ones that can bleed out in the field. Um, and the best thing to do if you see it is to pack it as well as you can um, and try to give them some fluids and resuscitate them. If, you, if interventional radiology isn't available, there, there's something described, although we don't usually do it anymore, it'd be pelvic packing. You have to actually open up the pelvis and start putting lap pads in. We, I've never had to do that. We try to avoid doing that because that will also cause bleeding. Um, but that's another option if interventional radiology is not in-house and not available.
So this is a patient of mine. This is um, an arteriogram done by interventional radiology. Um, and you can see here, these are the iliacs. And then you have the external iliac and the internal iliac. And you can see here, there's, there's bleeding from this vessel. That's the superior gluteal artery. And that's probably the most commonly injured vessel with a pelvic fracture because it comes out right through this little notch here, this sciatic notch. And you can imagine a lot of pelvic fractures, a lot of acetabular fractures have shards of sharp bone that break right there. So oftentimes they'll have uh, superior gluteal artery injuries and you can't put a binder on and stop that bleeding. The only way you can stop it is if uh, interventional radiology can, can coil the, the artery. And this is just another example of that superior gluteal artery going right through the notch, right near the bone. So does every patient need to be sheeted? I, we see a lot of pelvic ring injuries. I don't sheet 90% of the patients. The only people that really need it is if you think they have a pelvic fracture, they're hemodynamically unstable, those are the people that need a sheet. Not every pelvic fracture is unstable and not every patient needs to be sheeted, but I, what I would say is if it's properly applied, nobody would fault someone for coming in with a, with a sheet on. So back to our patient. So this is a vertical shear pelvic ring injury. Um, these are really unstable. They're vertically unstable. They're rotationally unstable. So when we fix these, we try to fix them with as much fixation as possible. So for her, I actually put a, a posterior plate on for her sacral fracture, which we don't, uh, I only have to do maybe once or twice a year. Um, and you basically have to make two incisions on their back and you have to slide the plate through. And these are all the nerves that come out of the sacrum. So it's kind of a dangerous plating to do, so we try to avoid it and it's kind of can cause hardware irritation. But for her, since it was so unstable, she needed that. She needed these, we call these sacral iliac screws, which close down the joints. Um, and we do just through bony corridors on x-ray. And then for her, I also plated her uh, rami fractures just to increase her stability. And that's just an example of the rami uh, plating we do. So these are her after x-rays. She needed every bit of this hardware, every screw. So you can see her um, ileums are equal now. Her rami fractures are reduced. She's got a nice strong screw right across the back of her pelvis. Um, this is another shot. She's got nice long screws to the front. Her, her ileums are nice and equal. And the symmetry of the ring of the pelvis is restored. And she's actually, um, she's about four or five months out now. She's walking without any help and she's going back to work. You know, she had, this was an isolated injury. She had very little head trauma. She didn't have any visceral injuries. And this is very highly, especially where she broke through the sacrum, when you break right through the nerve roots where they are, they have a high risk of um, nerve injury, like bowel and bladder injury. And she had no nerve injuries. So she was very lucky. Um, and in fact, when I usually see those x-rays, one of the sports guys gave it to me. He was on call and he said, I have a sacral fracture. And I thought he had like an old lady with a, you know, just a compression fracture. And those x-rays that I see, usually people, you see them the next day when they've already, they've died from some other issue and people don't usually live with that, that bad of a pelvic ring injury. But she, she did actually really well. So some take home points for pelvic fractures is, you should try to be aware of that people can have them, respect how deadly they can be and how people can have a lot of injuries associated with them, not just the pelvic ring, but visceral injuries, head, head injuries. You should have a low threshold to apply a pelvic sheet if you feel like they're hemodynamically unstable and you think it might help them. But make sure if you're gonna put it on that you put it in the right spot. Um, and if you see an open pelvic fracture, which is very uncommon, um, you should pack the wound and they should, they should be taken to a trauma center as soon as possible. So the next topic we're gonna to talk about is open fractures. You probably see a lot of these. We see a lot of them. Um, what is an open fracture? If you see any broken bone and it has even a poke hole wound over it, it's an open fracture until, until proven otherwise. So it, it communicates with the external environment. Why are they so bad and what's the big problem with them is infection. And infection leads to, to non-union or delayed union. So anytime I see a non-union in the office, meaning someone has a fracture, hasn't healed in four or five months, um, we always rule out infection. And if they've had an open fracture, they probably have some sort of infection, even if they're tiny poke hole open fractures. The, uh, you guys might be familiar, this classification is very um, well known. It's the Castillo and Anderson classification. It's how we 
would describe it to each other if we're taking care of open fractures. There's a grade one. It's basically an inside out injury. The bone pokes through the skin. It's a grade one. It's usually clean, low energy injury. Most people would feel very comfortable just debriding the fracture and fixing it definitively right away. The grade two injury, we use this one centimeter to 10 centimeter rule, but it's really something that's a moderate energy injury. You can always pretty much close the wound. There might be some contamination. Most people would probably fix these right away too. Um, and it's really a moderate amount of energy is the bigger thing than the size of the wound. And then the type threes are really high energy injuries. These are ones that you should really consider not fixing right away. And you should wash them out, take them back a second time before you would put, consider putting hardware in there. Um, sometimes they need soft tissue coverage with the flap. Sometimes they have vascular injuries. Um, these have huge open wounds, usually more than 10 centimeters. Or they can have small wounds, but if it's a really comminuted fracture, it's probably a grade three, even if the wound is not, not 10 centimeters. So these are ones you don't want to fix right away. It used to be that uh, in trauma surgery, if you had an open fracture, it had to go to the OR within six hours. And so people would have to get up in the middle of the night and take care of these fractures. And probably nowadays, most people are not treating open fractures in the middle of the night. Maybe something like this I would come in for. Um, but most fractures, we, we don't take to the operating room. And this, um, this whole th thing which people were doing for decades was based on pretty much one or two studies in the 1970s that showed that once you get to 10 to the fifth number of uh, bacteria, people will get infected, and that usually happens around five hours. If you leave a wound open for five hours that's contaminated, you get to this threshold of organisms and then they get infected. So they said, okay, we should take everybody within six hours. Um, and really people, uh, there's been a lot of studies, prospective studies, people don't really do that anymore. Now what people say, most orthopedic trauma surgeons would say, that it's the time to antibiotics more than it's the time that we go to the OR or the time that we debride it is more important than anything. So do, do you guys give antibiotics in the field? Do you have antibiotics on you? Mm -hmm. that, oops. So I think that would actually, that would be good. There's a lot of orthopedic trauma literature now. This is just one study from our, the major journal that we use, and they looked at um, just grade three open fractures, and that's probably who really needs it, the more open fractures, a poke hole open wound probably, if you waited till you got to the ER, wouldn't, wouldn't be terrible. Um, but they noted that if you waited more than 66 minutes, they did, they had about 200 patients in the study, that they had an independent risk factor for getting an infection, and this was grade three open fractures. So a lot of people are going to be in the field more than an hour before they get to the hospital. So it might be helpful if we could administer antibiotics as soon as they have an IV line. And this is another study that looked at um, infection rates. And you can see once you get past the 60-minute mark, the rate of infection starts to go up. So some other things you can consider when you see open fractures, you should try to splint um, any open fracture, any fracture that you see, make the limb look straight and put a splint on. Um, traction splints, we don't ever, orthopedic surgeons don't really do it, probably not necessary. Even the orthopedic literature about traction before we operate on people, we're putting less and less traction on, so probably not necessary. But um, a lot of patients come in and have small vascular injuries, intimal injuries, so the less moving around of the fracture that you can do as soon as possible, the better. So I would say everybody who has a fracture should try to be splinted in some way. Um, open fractures, if, if there's, they're going to bleed a lot. Most of the bleeding's from the bone, so um, usually just a compressive wrap would probably be fine. The only time I would say to use a tourniquet is if you have, you know, what looks like arterial bleeding. But most bleeding probably would, would be stopped with just a compressive wrap. And then if you see any bone that's outside the skin or bone that looks questionable and there's not a lot of soft tissue attachments, I would definitely save it and let us throw, throw it out if we don't want it. To be honest, we do throw out most of the bone that we get um, from you guys, but there's certain instances where we will use the bone. This is one of probably the most classic examples is this is the talus bone in the ankle, um, and there's really no good substitute for the talus. So even if we find it on the street somewhere, we would want it, and we would put it in betadine, and we would put it back in, because I'd rather them have an infection with the talus bone that, doesn't, that uh, has some necrosis than no talus at all, because there's really nothing, no substitute for it. 
So just give it to us and let us throw it away in the, in the ore. And that's an example of this extruded talus that we would fix and put back in. <clears throat> Here's another one. So this is pretty classic and uh, we'll put these back in and we'll fix them. So some take home points. You can put it back in, that's fine. I'd be fine with that. I'll take it out, I'll scrub it. <laughs> so some take home points. I think it would be ideal to have antibiotics in within 60 minutes would be, would be the best thing and most of the time they're not getting in the hospital in 60 minutes. If you see an fr open fracture, really any fracture, you should splint them. It'll decrease the soft tissue damage. It'll decrease the likelihood of having additional soft tissue damage or additional arterial um, injury or intimal tears. And any bone that you see, you just preserve it. Um, one last topic I wanted to cover which was the concept of damage control orthopedics. Does anyone know damage control from, it comes from the military, from the Navy. So it's the concept that in the military that a ship can absorb damage but still maintain its integrity, still maintain the mission, and that they, it can be fixed in, at sea and still, and still function for the mission. So uh, damage control trauma in general came from uh, general surgery trauma and then orthopedics adopted it um, in the 1970s. In the 1950s uh, was the first time when pe we started having femoral nails and tibial nails and we started actually not keeping people in traction for six to eight weeks until the bone healed and we started fixing things and Kushner um, was the first person to come up with a nail and he was one of the, he was a German fighting in uh, World War II and so then the pendulum swung that we fixed everything right away and we called it early total care. And if you had a femur fracture or tibia fracture or bilateral femur fractures, we would be in the OR until every, everything was fixed. And then what we noticed was that people were starting to develop a bunch of different problems from it. In, in particular, when you ream these femurs to get these nails in, there's a lot of uh, fat in the canals and the fat would get into the bloodstream and go to people's heads and people would get emboli, fat embolism syndrome. So when we started seeing that, then the pendulum swung back to where people n weren't going to the OR and they'd say, you're too sick to go to the OR. Um, and so I think now it's kind of, a lot of times we'll say we're too sick not to go to the OR, um, but there are a select few people who are in what we call in extremis and they can go one way or the other and us taking them to the OR can really push them uh, to, to uh, go into, uh, have problems with um, their breathing or head trauma. So most of the time we do take people because we have two trauma rooms in the OR every day and we like to fit it into our schedule and we want to get people in. Um, but sometimes it's better to wait. So the concept of damage control orthopedics was that we limit early surgery for musculoskeletal injuries in these so-called patients in extremis or these unstable polytrauma patients. So there are a select group of borderline patients um, who subjecting them to more blood loss and more operating room time is not, not healthy for them. So damage control orthopedics, you want to control bleeding. In terms of damage control in general, you want to decompress any head bleeding or any bleeding in the thorax. You want to decontaminate wounds. You want to splint fractures or put them into traction or X fixes. And you want to get them back to the ICU as soon as possible. And then we'll plan for our definitive surgery in a few days. So this is um, concepts from this first hit. So the first hit is their, is their trauma. And what happens is you'll have the inflammatory markers that go up in the first few hours from their injury. And if you look at labs from someone who's a trauma patient or someone who has, is in septic shock from infection, a lot of the labs are the same. They respond the same way. Your white count goes up, your ESR, CRP, those are markers of inflammation go up. Um, and there's a thought that if, if you get to a certain threshold of markers, and inflammatory markers that it can be fatal. So sometimes, you know, it's Monday morning at seven o'clock and we have a room and we have a polytrauma patient we want to fix and we're in this area right here. Their inflammatory markers are at their highest and maybe we shouldn't do surgery on them and increase their inflammatory markers and get them into this region. Maybe we should wait a couple days until that goes down. And so that's the body's natural response to trauma. And when you get into this region, you can get multi-system organ failure, ARDS. And so the second hit is the surgery. And so you can take someone who could be on this curve and start to have decreased inflammation. And what happens is they actually have an exaggerated response from the surgery and they start getting more inflammatory markers. 
And if you want to fix everything and, and start ringing their canals and start putting nails down, you can actually put them into this area here if you try to do early total care too soon. And then they can, that can result in, in death. So some ways that we, we do damage control in orthopedics, one thing that I'll do in, uh, definitely with pelvic fractures or acetabular fractures is I'll put them in skeletal traction and I'll just hang 20 pounds of weight off of them or 30 pounds of weight off them just to get everything aligned. It'll decrease the bleeding, it helps with pain until we can take them to the OR. Um, splinting is a form of damage control orthopedics. Probably for upper extremity stuff, we'll just, even if it's open, we'll just wash it out and splint it. Um, external fixers are things we'll do temporarily with, if they have open wounds, we'll put these wound vacs on. A binder would be a, a damage control. There's problems with binders, leaving them on for weeks. People get soft tissue problems, but you can leave a binder on for a few days um, if they're not ready to go to the OR. And then the biggest thing is wound debridement. It doesn't matter, you don't have to get to the OR in six hours, but debriding open fractures is important and doing an aggressive debridement is important. So we'll take people to the OR for that even if they're, if they're pretty sick, if they have open fractures. So some take home points about damage control orthopedics is early total care is not always the best option. There are some polytrauma patients who it's better uh, to avoid a second hit and to wait to do their surgeries. Any questions?